Hi everybody. Tonight's session, I'm going to talk about a brief thing on data harmonization. And this is, um, we thought of this as kind of a teaser for 2019, where the topic is going to be um, data harmonization. And so that's exciting. So we're gonna, I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about what is harmonization so we can get at least on sort of a common page. Then I want to talk about um, a talk about general approaches and rationales for why we would do certain things. And after I talk about that, I'll talk about sort of three sets of tools we've um, um, thought of to aid in different harmonization projects. Every project is, um, almost every project is unique in its own way. As we, as, you know, we learn more about methods and about data, um, you know, we evolve in things, but also, you know, we can tailor things, we can tailor um, different tools to different applications. So, um, yeah, we'll talk about tools and then we'll see if we have time for um, anything else. So, at the, end, at the end of the day, we all want to do analyses. Maybe these analyses are cross-sectional comparisons. Those are fun. Or maybe we want to do, look at longitudinal change over time maybe individual changes or um, change regressed on a covariate of interest, which is this really complicated um, rubric from Nesselrode and Baltus. This was, I think they called this a variable box, where you can conceptually think about differences in occasions or one occasion, differences in individuals, and, um, vari and differences in variables. Yeah? If the data box is from data. Ah, okay. Thanks for, thanks for letting me know, because it's in Nestle Road and Baltus, and they cited bus 74, but okay. Okay, good, good, good to know. At the end of the day, so at the end of the day, we want to do cool analyses, but sometimes we can't do our cool analyses because we're using data from multiple sources for some necessary reason. And so what do I mean, what do I mean by, by harmonization? Harmonization is really broad. I'm mostly going to talk about statistical methods for harmonization. So harmonization could, mean, could refer to qualitative assessments of the comparability of measures, um, all the way down to statistical approaches to equate and link measurement scales or tests. And this is not like a, like a black and white scale. There's a, there's a, um, there's a, there's a um, continuous scale between these different issues. Um, Different, so different, when we have you know, different studies, they often implement different measures due to either developmental differences in the target population. The investigators may have different um, opinions about what they want to measure to represent memory or you know, what have you. Um, and there are, of course, logistical issues um, for, for why we don't always measure the same thing. So harmonization across data sources can help synthesize information across sources and help us um, at either ask new questions or ask more precise questions. So that's why we want to do um, harmonization. Um, I would, so oftentimes when we talk about harmonization, you might hear um, the term integrative data analysis. This entails the analysis of multiple data sets, either together or in parallel, to address some um, hypotheses that you've got. So if you're, if you're pooling your data, you might be doing something like an individual participant meta-analysis. So you're pooling data across all these studies. And if you um, don't want to pool your data, you can do um, a coordinated analysis where you don't necessarily pool the data, but you um, run models separately in each data set, and then you combine the results and meta-analyze them that way. Um, both of these um, are, are forms of integrative data analysis and um, harmonization can play varying roles in, in each of them. Um, the goals of harmonization include, they give you a larger sample size that gives you increased power to ask questions that you can't, maybe can't address using um, individual data sources. This is really important for our geneticist buddies and for um, when you're looking at perhaps interactions between groups, some of which may be small. Um, you can also address innovative questions that can't be answered with one data source. 
Um, for example, what does cognitive change look like across the lifespan from age 5 to 80? Or is education or study membership a stronger predictor of study change? You have to have multiple data sets. Um, so I'll, I'm going to talk about approaches to harmonization now. And um, this comes from an AHRQ report um, from 2012 where they, they talked about pre-statistical harmonization. Your pre-statistical harmonization, that's the accounting work. This is the part that takes the most amount of time, um, usually. You're gathering available test data. You're evaluating the test responses. You're describing your samples um, in the um, in Rich's Pitch Project um, R01. It took us uh, its uh, psychometric integrative te technologies. Our goal is to um, bring together um, data sets from the health and retirement study and it's all of its international sister studies. It took us about two years just to get all the data and get a handle on what's going on in all these data sets. Um, and we're still working on that. Um, after you do your pre-statistical harmonization, you apply a tool um, to, to, to equate um, your, 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 your construct across the studies. And then you perform some diagnostics and you do some checks. Statistical harmonization. Um, this is like a Procrustean bed. Who's heard of Procrustes? Good job. Oh, a good, good group of people. So Procrustes was, um, in Greek mythology, he was this rogue bandit, right? And he, would, he had an inn. And at his inn, he had a bed. And anybody who came to his bed, if this person was too short, he would stretch them out so that they would fit the bed. And if the person was too tall, he would chop off their legs so that they would fit the bed. And um, we're kind of doing that a lot oftentimes in pre-statistical harmonization. So we're identifying the items that we want to use. We're renaming the variables into a common rubric, and this stuff can be automated to a certain degree depending on how much metadata you have, information about the data sets you have. Um, we have to recode our missing data codes. We have to figure out, do we want to do anything with outliers? Maybe we don't, maybe we do. Um, that, could, that could cause problems in, in our model um, if we don't deal with them sometimes. So do we want to chop off some appendages and like Windsorize distributions? Whatever we do, we have to make sure we do it very consistently across data sets. Sometimes we want to stretch out variable distributions. It depends, on the, it depends on the problem and it depends on how many bridge items or anchor items that we want across um, the, the studies that we have. Um, oftentimes we will, we will discretize our variables um, and then after that, we have to check for small cells. And after that, we need to check for anchor items. to make. So an anchor item is an item that's one item from a battery that's in common across your studies. And um, um, we'll, t we'll talk about that in a, in a, little, in a little bit. So this is pre-statistical harmonization. This takes a fun amount of time. So this is one way to visualize the number of items that are in common between studies. So this is a harmonization that we did between six cohorts. And there's a red bubble for each of the cohorts. And there's a green line, um, the thickness of which indicates the degree of overlap between these cohorts. So for example, the Cardia study has 19 um, cognitive tests. And the ERIC um, uh, study here has 24 cognitive tests, and there's nothing in common between Cardia and Eric. But Eric has a, the Eric ticks um, visits have a lot in common with the CHS ticks visits. That's fortunate. And so you can see which, which, um, which cohorts or which sets of data have lots of overlap um, among them. So that's a fun visualization. And so, did you that? pardon? How did you create that? So this is um, so um, there's uh, there's some this th I made this in Stata. This is a network plot, and so network analysis is different from harmonization, but a lot of the tools I found are useful for um, adapting for our uses for for harmonization purposes. And so I think it's called like net plot in Stata.
Um, and I'm sure R and SPSS have analogous programs. Um, one of the things that we, that when we go through a pre-statistical harmonization, when we're dealing with lots of data sets, um, we, we, um, we come across what, um, what Rich and I have coined the Anna Karenina principle. So this is your second literary reference today. So Anna Karenina starts out saying, um, happy families are all alike, and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Likewise, in our analog, well-designed studies are all alike, but every study um, uh, with design features that present challenges for analysis often will present challenges in its own way. And again, investigators chose, to, chose a certain study design in, in every study, and they chose their measures in order to address their important and relevant hypothesis, and lots of smart people contributed and, and, and put these studies together. But at the end of the day, this study, study A, might be different in some important reasons for study B. And if we're doing harmonization, oftentimes, we're pulling together these, these data sets for purposes other than the original intention um, um, in, in which they were designed. The picture I have here is a histogram of self-reported age in the LASI study, the longitudinal um, um, aging study in India. And it's subtle, but if you stare at this long enough, um, there's a digit preference for people's age of um, either in the tens or in the fives. In other words, there's over a thousand people in this study. A lot of them, especially at the older ages, don't know their age. If they don't know their age, what do we do with the other, a lot of the other self-report stuff? Um, we, start, we, start, we start worrying. But um, yeah, every data set has its own unique challenges. It's unique in its own way, oftentimes. So, um, you know, I'm I'll, I'm going to talk about tools in a little bit, but just to give us a roadmap, um, th this is sort of a, a a diagram for potentially what we might, how we might want to um, follow things and make decisions depending on what data we have, the specific challenge we have. Um, and this roadmap is not complete. It's a work in progress. And we're going to have a better one for you um, by next year, definitely. So the first question you've got to ask is, do you have individual participant data available across multiple studies? OK? If the answer is no, then, um, then um, you might uh, need to do linear equating across, across your studies of some sort. So um, actually, why would you? Mean equating, yeah. some type of equ so you've got you you might have a mean, um, a, an overall mean um, reported for this for, of this scale, and you can just equate the equate the means from in one data set and another data set by subtracting the difference off of one off of another data set. It's not the greatest approach. If you do have individual participant data, you can do a lot. You can you have a lot more options. So. Um, then, then your next question is: Item level data available to support a measurement model? So, like a factor analysis, similar to um, what all of us in our groups are, are working on in different ways. If the answer is yes, or it, let's go. If the answer is no, then if the samples, if the observations can assume to be equivalent, then you can do some sort of an equating approach. Like, and I'll talk about. Um, equipercentile and linear and z-scoring um, um, in a little bit. If the answer is no, um, you might um, be able to, to, to use multiple imputation for your data set. Back here, so if you have got item level data available to support a measurement model, and you have a small number of samples to be linked, then you could, do, you could use item response theory um, and, and, and construct the link. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. If the answer is no, then in M+, there's a, there's a tool called alignment analysis, which allows you to um, look, at, uh, look at a measurement model and measurement differences across many groups. Think about, like, states um, or countries or something like that. So pre
Another thing you could do is if you, have, if you do have individual participant data, but you don't have item level data available to support a measurement model, and you're not willing to assume that samples can be assumed to be equivalent, in addition to uh, multiple imputation, another thing you could do is just a coordinated analysis. For example, if you want to look at the, um, um, if we're interested in looking at um, um, sex differences in the rate of cognitive decline, but across our multiple studies, we don't have a common cognitive test, and we don't want to go through um, um, the, the joys of item response theory um, 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 co-calibration, then um, we could just say in each data set, we're going to choose, say, a memory test. And we'll, we'll all run regressions using that memory test, and we'll, we'll try to meta-analyze meta those results. You're, you're, you're evaluating generalizability across samples as well as across um, um, measures of um, similar constructs. And please introduce, um, um, interrupt me at any point. So let's talk about some tools for co-calibration. We'll, I'll talk about distribution-based tools, item-based tools, and then multiple imputation for missing data. The goal of a distribution-based tool is to define a transformation of a test that returns the same cumulative probability plot as the other variable um, on, in, in, a, in another data set being compared. And there are three tools for that. There's straightforward mean equating, linear equating, and then echo percentile equating. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you pictures of these guys. So in mean equating, um, in, in all of these things, we've got a relative position. And for mean equating, the relative position is defined by just, just the mean. So its relative position is defined by the absolute difference from the sample mean of a test. And each individual score is, gets in, in the second test will get changed by the same amount to equate the sample mean to that, of a ref to that of the reference test on the left. And so obviously, as you can imagine, if I were to equate this second test by just adding a constant value to every observation, then values up here may uh, be greater than what is theoretically possible on this test. So that's a limitation of this approach. And, but, and at the end of the day, you're getting tests whose means are similar across your studies. Linear equating uses not only the mean, but also the standard deviation. And um, it, it, it shifts up the, the mean and also um, makes, uh, makes the shape of the distribution um, more common across, across the, the, the two data sources. And this works best when you have a normally distributed variable. If you do not have a normally distributed variable, if your variable is highly skewed, then um, um, a good approach is equipercentile equating. So here, we're looking at individual percentile ranks for each test. And so what we do is we identify percentiles for scores on a reference test. So every score has a possible percentile for the reference test, and then we find the, the, the corresponding score on the, other t on the second test that has that same percentile. And, um, so, and then so, so we, we make the values for each percentile to be the same. So even if you've got like a wacky, weird bimodal distribution, you can make it look um, um, like the distribution you, um, you have in your reference sample. Um, this is something you can do with the MMSC. For example, um, you know, we're, you, we're, we're quite accustomed to a 30-point MMSC, but in, other st in many studies, and in, especially in um, um, cross-national research, they use different point totals for MMSCs. So we had data from a 19-point MMSC, and we used echo percentile equating to show that a score on a 20, uh, a score of 23 on the 30-point MMSC, um, in, in the sample that we had was, um, um, that was at about the 14th um, um, percent um, percentile in the sample, and the 14th percentile in the sample on the 19-point MMSC is a 14. 
So a f M MMSC of 14 out of 19 um, appears to be comparable to a 23 out of 30 um, using our data. An important limitation here is your equating will depend on the distributions and of, of the variables in your particular um, sample that you've got. So this is how it's done. You guys will have the slides so you can, you can fiddle around with these things. It's basically straight math. So with mean equating, you're, again, you're subtracting off means. For linear equating, you're taking into account means of the tests as well as standard deviations. And for equipercentile equating, you can automate the, the um, um, finding a, um, a, uh, your, your percentiles. There's an R package for that called equate, and it's really swell. Um, another thing that I want to point out, oftentimes we like to take z-scores um, of, of our tests. And z-scores is a variant of linear equating, but you're, you're taking an extra step. The extra step is that reference test that has a certain mean and standard deviation, you're z-scoring that to have a mean of zero and a variance of one. Okay. So these are distribution-based approaches. Some of the problems with distribution-based approaches, they equate scales, not metrics. So, you know, I can make um, a mean of anything look like a mean, a mean of something else, um, but that doesn't mean that a one-point change on the reference test is the same thing as a one-point um, change on the second test, right? Um, Distribution-based approaches are blunt force tools. They not only erase um, measurement differences that, you, that to you are nuisance variables, they can obliterate age differences or sex differences or differences in rate of cognitive decline by whatever scientific question we want to address. And there are ways around this, but it, um, it's important to, to just to recognize that these are based on um, means, standard deviations, or um, percentiles of a sample, right? And it's important to think carefully, carefully about what you want to equate. Um, do we want to, say, equipercentile equate, you know, a, one memory test with another memory test, like the AVLT with the CVLT? How comfortable are we that these tests are really measuring the same construct um, versus what if we wanted to equate the um, digit symbol substitution measured with two different versions of the WACE? Um, um, and is there sufficient variability to support this relative position? Um, so um, I did a paper using echo percentile equating, and my beloved mentor immediately, within an hour really, out of reading the paper, sent back this um, paper where he equated the MMSC with shoe size. So what this shows is that among people with an observed MMSC of less than 24, the maximum equated shoe size is seven. So if you want to screen for dementia using shoe size, um, you might flag as possibly demented people with a shoe size of less than seven. Shoe size is not cognitive status. This is inappropriate to use. So it's, again, it's important to think carefully about what you want to equate Consult your experts um, in, in different fields. Consult your subject matter experts and your clinicians to figure out, you know, um, what to equate. Um, so these are distribution-based methods. They have limitations. Um, people love to use them. Um, we use, we use Z-scores so often. I want to talk about item-based methods. If you've got item-level um, information... Um, then you can use item response theory. And so I think a lot of us are familiar with item response theory, so just briefly I'll go through it. Um, really, so in, in um, classical test theory, we're interested in scoring um, a person's performance on you know, a test, and we get the score for a person. But item response theory, people are really interested not only in the score of a person, but what's the score of a test? How, how difficult is a particular item on this test? 
and can we can we rank these items in relative difficulty? So the um, all the all the, the importance of IRT is really encapsulated in the item characteristic curve, which is an S-shaped logistic function. And on the y-axis here is the probability of a correct response. And so for on the on the x-axis is the latent trait level. It's the person's um, ability level. So if we're talking about cognitive <coughs> functioning, maybe on the on the um, left side. Uh, people, the, uh, if somebody sits on the left side, then they have low levels of cognitive functioning, and people who sit on the right side have high levels of cognitive functioning. And people with low levels of cognitive functioning, for this particular item, and we have an item character, an I ICC um, for each item, and for each threshold of each item, um, a person far at the left has near, near zero percent chance of endorsing the item. And a person on the right who has high cognitive functioning has a really good um, um, probability of endorsing the item. And we assume that we have a normally distributed um, latent trait in, in our population. Okay, And so the two important parameters that define the item characteristic curve is the um, um, loading or the slope which is the steepness of this ICC at its steepest point, and the location. So the, the, the location where the probability of correct responses, it's location on the x-axis where the probability of correct responses is 0.5. So on this, um, that's drawn to be about, this, this particular item happens to have a location of about zero in, in this sample. And you can have different items that are harder or easier or more severe or less severe, depending on what your construct means, okay? So in item response theory, so we're, we're using multiple items or multiple tests. And so, you know, um, something that always comes up, how granular can we get? Um, it depends on the test. So for a trail-making test, we, um, we can really we can we can make use of the total time it takes to 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 complete the task, um, or and we can also take into account the number of errors one commits. Maybe um, for the um, for say an AVL for an auditory verbal um, learning test or any wordless learning task, we can look at um, the, maybe the individual words might be items, or maybe we want to sum. Um, across um, trials of the test. Um, this is something to, to discuss. But anyway, so here in this, in this table, this is just an example table from one, of the, um, from one study we did. Where we, so we've got a column for each data set. And I've got a row for, uh, with an X in it to indicate um, whether a, a given test was administered. And so semantic fluency for A for animals was available in a lot of these studies. Whereas the um, symbol digits modalities test was only available in two of these studies, um, we had an issue with the Boston naming test where there um, some studies administer a 15 um, um, card version and other studies administer a 30 card version. So um, an important assumption in IRT is the exchangeability of items. So we're constructing a latent variable which is um, it's a reflective latent variable that, is, that um, underlies performance on a bunch of cognitive tests. And if you're missing on one of these cognitive tests, and if that missingness is maybe systematic by um, whether you were in study A or study B, then um, that missingness might be okay as long as you've got other items that are not missing. The, the more missing items you have, the less precision you've got in, in your scale. But, um, but you can still use whatever items that you have available to, to score um, cognitive performance or whatever latent variable you're working, on, you're working with for that particular person or record. So it's okay that adneuromed is missing digit span and logical memory. It's not okay that semigasostat trial is... Oh, they're not missing everything. They have an MMSC. It's great. So sometimes we can break out the MMSC into its item level 
um, components, the individual um, um, items on the MMSC, or depending on your question, depending on the availability of your data, sometimes you might use the 30 point total. Okay. So um, I want to talk about scaling a latent variable in item response theory, because this is really important for harmonization. So in latent variable space, there's no natural scale. Um, by convention, we usually set that latent variable to have a mean of zero and a variance of one in our sample. And our sample in a, in, in a harmonization, in, 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 in a data harmonization, we're stacking data sets and, and um, we might do a factor analysis of a bunch of items across our two data sets. So a mean of zero and a variance one has relevance internal to, internally to those to the combination of those two or more studies that we've got. Um, this is by no means, you know, um, um, gospel promise scales their constructs. The uh, that's patient reported outcomes um, scales their constructs to a T scale, which has a mean 50 and standard deviation of 10. Other people use different um, scaling. IQ is scaled on I think what is it a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 15. Um, yeah, so we can scale a, a, a variable in M plus, and here's how we would do that. So let's assume that you've got a bunch of data, and you've done your pre-statistical harmonization, and you have 17 items. You don't have 17 items that are in common across these studies, but at least some of those 17 items need to be in common across the studies so that those items provide um, bridge items or br uh, bridge the metric across your, across your samples. So this is, um, we've, we've got a long data set with, um, um, uh, where we've d stacked our data sets. And this, um, as, as Rich showed us in his tutorial last night, we've got our model statement and GCP is our latent variable. It's, it's measured by U1 to U17, and by convention in M+, the first factor loading is fixed at 1, but we want to free that factor loading, so that's why the asterisk is there. We want to free that factor loading so that we can constrain the, the variance of the GCP at 1 and the mean at 0. This is internally scaling the, um, the, 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 the resulting factor to the sample that we have. The disadvantage here is that if we go and publish our paper and say that, you know, on average people who are um, um, people with low cognitive reserve have, um, across our harmonized data set, have a, have a, have a um, GCP factor score of negative 3.2, um, it's hard to really judge what that means. It's relative to the sample that you've got in your data set. So in a, um, one potentially um, 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 viable approach, it depends on your question, it depends on, um, what, on, um, on your capabilities sometimes. Um, we're still, we can still do an internal scaling using M+, and the data are still stacked and pulled together, but we can do a two-step approach. And the first step, the first step looks exactly like um, the, the earlier example, where we're just estimating a, um, or we're just estimating our latent variable and fixing it to have a mean of zero and variance one, but we're only doing this in the first data set, or, uh, and this data set is theoretically important and relevant, or maybe we're only doing this in a subset of our, of our population, maybe only among males, maybe only among people aged 65 to 75. It's your call, whatever you wanna do. That's step one. Step two is in the full data set, you estimate your GCP, but now you're freeing your variance of the, G, of the GCP and you're freeing the mean and you're fixing the loadings and not shown here, you're also fixing thresholds and you get the values of these, of these loadings and these thresholds, all of these item parameters, you get the values from what they were estimated as being in step one in your reference sample. And so this can help you um, um, describe, you know, this latent variable has a mean of zero and a variance of one in this particular sample. So this can, this can help us um, um, interpret what the score means. Um, this is how, um, just the basics of how we would link items to an external scale using M plus. 
and it looks just like um, step two from, from earlier. We have GCP uh, measured by U1, U2, U7. We're freeing the mean and the variance of the GCP. But now we found from some external reference, we found um, 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 it, uh, um, we found this factor loading for, for this particular item, this factor loading for this particular item, and these are, um, these are our threshold parameters. And we found these thresholds, and we're comfortable fixing the, 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 these parameters in our data set to what they are in this external reference data set. For example, um, something that, um, that, that I like doing is when I'm, when I'm estimating a factor score for um, general cognitive performance, we can externally scale. Um, assuming that there are items in common between your data set and Adam's HRS, we can externally scale the, the factor in, um, in, in your data set to, um, to the um, distribution of general cognitive performance in Adam's HRS because we've got those data and we can run an IRT model in those data using the available um, cognitive test items. And um, yeah, in this particular example, we were doing, this was not general cognitive performance. We were looking at harmonizing um, everyday functional ability across um, a bunch of studies. And we wanted to externally um, sort of peg the scale for everyday functioning to the NIH promise norms. And so if you go to assessmentcenter.net, um, I think it's still there, you could sign up for free and you could, and you could, you could go in and see all of the item parameters for every um, item that, that has been, for, in every scale that's been administered in Promise. So the goal of Promise was to identify a bunch of patient reported outcomes um, and, and use computer adaptive testing um, to, to decide which questions might be asked of a patient um, in order to, to um, identify their level on a, on a particular latent variable. And one of the, one of the um, first constructs that Promise looked at was, um, every, was IEDL functional ability. So there's a scale in Promise that uh, for IEDL functioning. There's a bunch of scales. And if you log in, um, IRT is the basis for, for, um, for, for the promise scaling, and they'll show you the, um, the factor loading and the thresholds. So you can just mine that. Um, some, matter, some things to be aware of when using IRT for co-calibration. Um, as we just talked about with internal scaling and external scaling, you want to make sure that your scale is interpretable and that it's, that it's useful. Um, it's um, important to check for differential precision or ceiling effects um, across your different studies or across time. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, I want to talk about selecting an estimator, uh, making sure the metric is the same across studies. And um, yeah, that one. So checking for differential precision. In addition to, so we can estimate levels of a person. We can estimate the factor scores for a person or for an observation. And then we can either um, estimate those, those, those latent variables as factor scores and use those in, in regressions and send them to people to use. We can also um, develop a measurement model within our harmonization scheme and model changes or regressions um, within um, our harmonization latent variable model. But um, basically, we're estimating levels for a person. But in addition, IRT can quantify the precision of the estimated value, OK? And more information leading to improved precision um, is usually a good thing. But sometimes it's not the best thing when it's differential across a study or differential across a study, across a, a study visit. Um, this is the study design for the ERIC NCS um, study, Atherosclerotic Risk in Communities. They had, a, they had a, what's called a visit two in 1990 to 92, where they administered three cognitive tests. At this point, this cohort was in their mid 40s. The investigators were not concerned about really measuring cognitive performance in the early 1990s in a bunch of um, 40 to 50 year olds. So um, they only, they had this word, uh, the uh, word fluency test, 
They have a digit symbol substitution and this delayed word recall. There was no immediate word recall in, in, in this administration. Visit four, um, which was just six years later, they administered the same tests. And visit five in 2011, it's more than 20 years later. These guys are in their 60s and 70s. Cognition is important to study now. So we're going to administer a, um, a larger battery of tests. And so what we did with this was we wanted to be able to study cognitive change. We wanted to be able to use all of the, um, all of the items available. So if you flip this 90 degrees at visit two, this is your latent cognitive performance variable, and these are your observed indicators. Same thing for visit four. And at visit five, we also have this latent variable, and um, these, we have more indicators. And what's important is this is similar to your um, um, growth and factors model that we that um, um, Rich talked about last night. We fixed loadings to be the, uh, for for like items to be the same across time, and we do the same thing for thresholds so that any change or shifts in in these items um, are punted down to the mean and the variance of the circles, these latent um, cognitive performance variables. We can do that using all of the data, and we would call that general factor a general cognitive performance factor. We can use it, we can do it using only the memory items, in which case we would call this memory. We can create an executive functioning slash speed factor and a language factor. So we can do that, and um, the general factor performs pretty nicely. Um, this is a distribution at each time point for the domain-specific factors. And um, what I want to focus your attention on is this memory factor score up here. So at visit two, this was, a his, this was the histogram of scores. It was um, um, the, the factor scores ranged between one and negative one. And the only item informing a memory at visit two was this delayed word recall, which, is, which can only have 10 um, discrete values. And so it's really not a very precise test. It's what was available. Um, the same thing is present in visit four. And in visit five, we've got some great tests. We've got the logical memory test now um, and incidental learning. And these are, these are okay tests relative to a delayed word recall. So we have increased precision. And this increased precision becomes manifested in, um, a, uh, in a dropped floor because now instead of, instead of only being able to measure really people um, between one and negative one standard deviation units around the mean with, these, with this extra precision, these more items for memory, we can go down to a negative four. This is great. We have increased, improved precision in the tail. So we see differences in floors based on the precision of the information available. That's differential by study visit. Initially, when we created these, we didn't think that these dropped floors would be differential by a predictor. We had identified them, but we didn't really think about them. Um, in fact, they are. So um, Priya Palta was doing a study of physical activity and cognitive decline. And using the, this memory factor score, she was finding pretty strong, um, a pretty strong effect of physical activity on um, memory decline. But then when she looked at just change in the raw delayed word recall variable, she wasn't really finding an association. So why was that? What's happening? So people who have low physical activity tend to have, at visit two, they tend to have low cognitive functioning. So if they have low cognitive functioning, at visit two, they might have a score of, say, negative one. They might have a true score in reality of negative three, but you're only going to observe a score of negative one for them um, because that's how precise the measure was. And then they're going to look like this, and then they're going to really tank um, by, the, by the time we get to visit five. So their trajectory is pretty steep. On average, a person with a high level of um, uh, physical um, um, activity uh, levels um, is going to be here in the distribution of cognitive functioning and they're going to be here and here, and maybe they'll experience a little bit of cognitive decline, but they're not going to be as steep as the person who started in the lower range of the distribution. So what this ends up doing is 
by having this drop ceiling, this factor score um, creates spuriously large um, 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 differences in, in estimated associations of this exposure with cognitive decline. Um, it induces a, um, an effect that that's unfortunate, and we didn't want that. So, sorry, Priya. Um, so that's how that can happen. This is a familiar methods effect. This is a study from 2004 where, um, that, that um, Rich did where um, this, was, um, this, this was a depression scale. And at the first wave of the, of the HRS, all of these depression items were measured on a four-item Likert scale. And then, I guess to save time, at subsequent waves, these items were measured on a two-item um, um, on a uh, scale, um, no or yes. And so when you do, you, when, when, when he did a factor analysis, obviously he's got a floor effect, um, at, at, which looks the same at visits two and three, but because you've got in, improved precision, you've got a dropped floor at visit one because there were four um, item resp response categories at, um, at wave one, which leads to uh, more information, particularly at the lower level. <sighs> so we talked about checking for differential precision. Let's talk about let's talk about selecting an estimator. This gets into the nitty gritty, but it becomes substantively important um, when we when we, when we when we um, do a project. So you. I'll talk about three possible estimators. The maximum likelihood estimator, the WLSMV estimator, weighted least squares, and then because Gerald asked about Bayes last night, um, we'll talk about a Bayesian estimator too. So the maximum likelihood, in maximum likelihood estimation, all the records get used except the records where there's 100. That's interesting. Except the records where there's missing data on um, uh, on um, 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 predictor variables, or if there's missing data on all of the outcome variables. Okay, so in general, um, all the records are going to be used. The data assumption is MAR, missing at random, and it's pretty reasonable in a lot of epidemiologic settings where we do have missing data that is not MCAR. In fact, a lot of it might be MNAR, and that's a different ballgame. Um, WLSMV estimators are accurate, they're efficient, they're fast but they're inappropriate when MCAR assumptions are not viable. Um, so, um, for example, if you've got a situation where you're harmonizing data across multiple studies and, you know, you have um, a set of items in, in one study and you've got some overlap but not, not necessarily the same items in the other study, um, if you've got, you can, you can potentially have, if you were to try to correlate all of these items in your pooled data, you're going to see holes in your correlation matrix. And maximum likelihood is the only approach that can handle those holes. WLSMV will, will um, crash. And so bo both MLR and WLSMV provide regression-based factor scores, um, uh, factor score estimates if, if you wanted to use those. Um, if you use a Bayesian estimator, the Bayesian estimator gives gives results very very close to um, that are very close to those from an MLR estimator in terms of the parameters, but um, instead of a factor instead of a regression based factor score, um, when you use a Bayesian estimator, you get Bayesian plausible values. And what these guys are, um, you can you can ask for say thirty or a hundred different. Um, draws from the posterior distribution after you run your item response theory model. And as the number of draws from the posterior increase, we should reach MLR regression-based factor score estimates, right? So regression-based factor scores, um, every, every record that has the same response pattern gets the same values. So this might be appropriate if you're doing something um, that involves like high, t high stakes testing or if you're going to make a decision, a clinical decision based on somebody's score because you want, you want it to be fair because you want somebody with the same response pattern to um, have the same um, score. 
If your goal is to estimate population parameters, which is what, often what we're doing in epidemiologic inference, we're not necessarily trying to do things in, um, um, on an individual level, then plausible values may be desired because they retain imprecision in estimates. For example, um, in other words, the, the, somebody with two people who have the same exact response pattern um, might potentially have slightly different plausible values. Not by a lot, but slightly different plausible values because we're averaging across all these, uh, across a bunch of draws drawn from a posterior distribution. So we get to preserve a little bit more error with um, plausible values when you use a Bayesian estimator. So let's talk about the metric um, being the same across studies. I'll mention briefly, it's important to look at um, differential item functioning by data set. So for example, in our pre-statistical harmonization, let's say that I identified a bunch of items that, that may be common across two studies, but you know, I could have made a mistake. In my pre-statistical harmonization, maybe I looked at, at the form, maybe I, I looked at the means and the, um, um, uh, the variances of, of my variable, I looked at the range, the min and the max, um, but maybe I missed something. So um, oftentimes testing for diff by study can, can, can help um, resolve something. We were doing a harmonization um, um, a while ago where we had animal recall that was measured in common between the ERIC study and the CHS study, the cardiovascular health study. So that's great, we can use that as an anchor. But wait, diff testing identified a problem. There's a difference in, in, animal, um, in animal recall between ERIC and CHS. And that differ what was that different? The difference was that in ERIC, um, the question, the, the task to participants was, please recall in, is this beeping? Okay, cool. Um, in ERIC, animal recall was in 60 seconds, Please recall as many animals as you can. Go. And in the CHS, the question was, in 60 seconds, please recall as many four-legged animals as you can. So in CHS, the mean distribution of animal recall was much lower than it was in Eric and in any other study. So we, could, we realized in a post hoc way from diff testing, we can't use animal recall um, as a common item between the CHS and ERIC. We can still use animal recall in both of these studies. They're just not common across the, across the cohorts. Um, another thing you can do to sort of verify that the metric is common across studies that we often do is um, simulation. And so in simulation, you can imagine a population in which all the indicators were administered to all respondents, right? And you, we can do this in simulation as, as Maria's work group is learning. And you can derive a true theta from this by, by doing a factor analysis of every item um, that, 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 that was administered. And you, in, this, in our simulated world, we can also derive a data set specific factor that's based on the cognitive tests were, which were available in that study. And then um, we compare the true theta with this data set specific factor and we can make Bland-Altman plots. And this is what, something we often do. So um, here we're graphing the difference between the truth and the data set specific factor against the average. And what we'd, what we'd love to see is, a, is uh, something that looks similar to Ross or even to ACT, where we see a thin, um, tight, some tight lines um, across the range of the, of the, um, of the factor scores. Uh, this semigasis stat trial didn't work out so well. Um, we, had, uh, we, ha we didn't have many anchor items. In addition, there weren't that many items overall. In this particular trial, if memory serves, we only had a couple um, mental status type items, uh, maybe from an MMSC, I think. So you, got, you have um, greater levels of imprecision, and it could arguably be differential across the range of um, cognitive functioning. David. 
the scale in which those are on, how do you evaluate tightness versus not tightness depending on what that scaler is? Yeah, um, so, right. Um, the tightness is proportional to the um, precision, to the information in the estimate. Um, I didn't... Um, I didn't bother to. Um, I mean, I say that because your tens yeah. are obviously way out, but how do you decide what 0.5 and 0.29 and 0.19 and what's the mean? And then yeah. is that a standard deviation? So, and so this mean is like a bias. And these scores were on a T score, so they have a standard deviation of 10. So okay. 10 would be there's a standard deviation difference, 5, half a standard deviation, and so forth. Overall, all of, these, um, all of these means were pretty close to um, zero. So that's the bias. And then the acceptance interval um, was, I want to say this, this was the interval, the sort of a, where um, the top, um, uh, uh, where, uh, the top between the 10th and the 90th percentiles or something like that. Um, and, Yeah. Well, um, it could be an index of diff. We're not looking at specific items here. We're looking at the overall um, um, factors okay. and to seeing whether these factors okay, so are the same as or, whether these factors correspond with the truth across each data set. In other words, is the metric common across the yeah. factors? Okay. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'll talk, is it, so a perennial problem that we, that we get asked, in fact, we were asked this just last week in a paper, um, reviewers will ask, is it a problem to estimate an IRT model with repeated measures on people? And the, 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 the critique goes like this. A potential problem involves the non-independence of the measures, although robust estimators were used and... Um, um, they can only go so far in eliminating the high degree of non-independence. So I, I should back up here. The challenge here is we're doing a harmonization um, um, within a study, and we have multiple records per person. And so um, let's say that um, we have, um, it's like the ERIC study, where we have different um, tests that were administered at um, different visits, right? And so we're, we're basically doing a harmonization where we're stacking um, multiple rows um, per person, potentially. And so there's, there's, there's non-independence between these measures. Um, one thing that we've done to sort of try to address this is to run sensitivity analyses by estimating models that are estimating IRT models for harmonization that are based on only one record per person. Do this you know, 100 times, do this 10,240 times, basically get bootstrapped estimates the, the, of, of your item parameters and your um, factor scores if you want to. Uh, actually, but let's only focus on item parameters. Item parameters, I'm referring to the factor loadings and the thresholds. This should yield the same model parameters, the loadings and the threshold, as a model that used all the records in your longitudinal data set. The one thing that does change is the standard errors of your item parameters do become larger when we use just one record per person. However, when we're doing a harmonization, we're not paying attention to standard errors of our factor loadings and our, and our thresholds. We're, we're paying attention to the absolute values of those, factor, of those um, loadings and thresholds because those absolute values are contributing to estimation of the factor scores and information and estimation of precision. Um, okay, so we talked about distribution-based approaches, item-based approaches, and how are we doing on time? We're doing great on time. I'll talk in one slide about multiple imputation for missing data. I've not really done a project like this, but um, the approach exists, and it's something that um, potentially um, some of you might be interested in. The notion goes like this. Assume that we have you know, two data sets. In data set one, you've got um, 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 a diabetes diagnosis, you've got HbA1c levels measured, and you've got glucose measured. 
Um, and in data set two, we've got a diabetes diagnosis and we've got gu glucose, but we don't have HbA1c. And let's say that you want to study in these two data, in these two pool data sets, the association of HbA1c with cognitive functioning. Well, in data set two, you don't have HbA1c levels. If I want to use HbA1c in the pooled sample, you could predict it based on diabetes status and fasting glucose using multiple imputation methods in the pooled sample. The multiple imputation will reflect uncertainty in your unmeasured data, um, but as long as both data sets measure the same construct, then we can um, um, rely on um, we can rely on this imputed HbA1c level in data set two. And here, what you're really, I think what you're really relying on is the correlation between diabetes and HbA1c and the correlation between glucose and HbA1c in data set one being similar to what it is in data set two. And Paul's enjoying this. What do you, what, thoughts, Paul? derived average glucose measure, uh, there's a mathematical equation between fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C that I would recommend. Are you saying you don't need to do what he did? Is that what you're saying? Uh, he asked me why I was shaking my head no. Okay. I was shaking my head no, because for this particular example, you should Doesn't work. formula. Analogy. All right. <laughs> the analogy. I told you. I told you. Yeah. We'll find a better analogy next time. So I was just talking to Rich um, last night about analogies. So Scott Adams is the guy, is the guy who made Dilbert. And he wrote this book um, about um, why certain people got elected to office in 2016. And in his book, he, he makes it, the argument about um, that you really should avoid using um, analogies like I just gave. And the reason is, if you're, argue, if you're, um, if you're communicating with somebody, um, it, or if you're trying to market to somebody, or if you're, or if you're, if you're debating with somebody and trying to bring somebody over to your side, then once one side has used an analogy, Scott Adams claims that side has lost the argument already without knowing it. The reason is, you should be able to say something without using that analogy, and that what you've said should be clear enough without having to resort to the analogy. So I'm using an analogy here because I've not done this before, and I don't have a good example to show you, and I've lost it already. So, um, I'm going to shut up, and then you go through your case. Thank you. So IRT. You can find it in ancient cave paintings. Paintings. This is a factor analysis with a bunch of indicators on rock. And I do have other slides. I do realize it's 8.20. Um, do we want to stop or do we want to go on? OK. Any questions? No, I can, I can say it without the microphone. Dorothy Sayers, great writer and philosopher, has the following statement. Ultimately, all reasoning is analogical. So. Is analogical? Like analytics and uh. Analogies. Analogies are okay. Okay. Are you can okay. use analogies. Thank you. Okay, good to know. Just pick the right ones. I'll pick the right ones. I can take you to source. Okay. Dorothy Sayer, thank you. Which is kind of a also statement that is analogical. Yeah. <laughs> Paul. Can you go back to the slide where you had three time points with one measure at the first two time points and then you added some additional back? This measure. guy? Two this guy? The previous one. That one. Thanks. So, looking at the memory one, what I don't understand is between visit four and visit five, you've got this massive number of people who have scores below the bottom score for visit four, right? Mm -hmm. 
the scale from measurement from visit four, wouldn't those people all be stacked up in one long horizontal bar? So something else that happened between visit four and visit five was a lot of time, on average about 15 um, or more years that happened. So there's not only changes in the measurement, there's, change, there's aging and things that we want to that we want to um, parameter that we want to understand and study. Okay. So you think that's real? You think that there's about looks like about half. It's hard to tell from that, but with the shading, it looks like half a sample or more. Yeah. Is that the floor of what was measured initially? I mean, because you said this was a precision, and to me, it looks like what we've got is a a profound shift in the mean. Well, I, th I, think it's, I think it's a spreading out of precision, and I th the reason I think that is because when you look at other um, factor scores, this is the one for executive functioning, this is the one for language. For language, we see a little bit um, increased um, ceiling, but it's not as extreme as it was for memory. And I, uh, so I can show you the information plots for these scores, and for memory, it visit, visits two and four, it's just pretty poor. David. Did you look or, at, the, at the, what would happen in the next slide if you took out the new instruments and only yeah. incorporated that? Yep. And did you see that profound floor effect then? No, we did not see it there. So then it's not just precision, it's some problem with your modeling. Because what you're saying is there's local dependence. Including or excluding an, an item shouldn't change the parameters. Potentially, but with those extra items, we're giving the model more information. We're giving the model more information at the lower end, aren't we? Yeah, but it, it shouldn't change the scores. It should change the precision of the scores. But, and it, so the people at the bottom I see what you're saying. might yeah. have an unbounded score, right? It's at least this low. Yeah. Sure. But they should all stack up there. It shouldn't change the shape of the distribution of the ability level. But so if I've got, so if you've got a bunch of people who, um, so the delayed word recall had a, um, um, had a, um, basically it was, it was a very straightforward test. There was a strong ceiling effect. It's not separating out people at, at um, say, higher ability levels. But if you add items that separate out people at higher ability levels that, that distinguish those people, then the resulting factor score should reflect that increased resolution, right? But it wouldn't change the distribution, right? So you can, you can start to differentiate between people at the high end, sure. But if you don't have the new precise stuff in your scale, then it, they should still be there. They'll just be collapsed into the top category. Yeah. For the top option. Yeah, it would look like you, similar to what you see at visit two and visit four, maybe some decline, but... So there's, there's some issue here. You know, if I know Alden, he put all those tests through the same machine. And the fact that it looks reasonable for executive functioning in language Happens makes here. me think that that may be real. But when you see, when I see distributions like that, you want to check everything very carefully. But it's probably pretty real. And it's a big study, right? Mm -hmm. Sample sizes. 15,000. 15,000. So the height of those histograms could be varying across those, you know, across those different waves and make given that extra horrible spready look. But it's suspicious, but... That's why we now recommend not using domain-specific factor scores in this study. But the problem still exists, even if you, if you throw a lot of other cognitive domains in there. Because none of those other factors go below negative two. Right. So there's still going to be some people who are appearing to decline in the negative two to negative four range. Yeah. So that's something that could be a presentation at next year's meeting. Yeah. We need the Procrustes bed here. Yes. How would you apply Procrustes bed here? Um, well, you could um, get an estimate for wave five 
cognitive ability that was based on a subset of tests that had the same information function as version 2 and version 4. Yeah. yeah. That's, what I yeah. That's something we could do, yeah. And since you only use a subset of your items, you would you could randomly select among those and do your bootstrap trick again. Yeah. It sounds like a great idea for a project for next year. Anybody else? Any other questions? One thing that I do want to point out, you know, just because you have um, one tool and your data might suggest that you've got one tool doesn't need doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have to use that one tool. I showed you a flow diagram of different options. Um, so um, in in this one project, we have an we have the AVLT, and the AVLT has different list word list versions, and different word list versions are usually parallel, but they're not necessarily equivalent. So what this picture is showing, this is data from the active study. At um, baseline, there was um, a, not much difference between a, a group that received memory training and, and a group that received no memory training, a control group. Between 0 and 0 0.2 um, um, years, the group received training, uh, and they, so, so you should see improved memory performance, but instead they tanked. The control group de deteriorated a lot more, and then they worsened even, both groups worsened even more after year one, and they shot up. This is a problem of differential, oh wow. This is a problem of, um, of the forms are different difficulties. These wordless um, learning tasks are not the same. So knowing what I knew at the time, I applied linear equating methods. And if you apply mean equating or linear equating and equipercentile equating, you get increasing um, 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 resolutions, you can get I increasing ability to, to um, detect change um, and to make these trajectories look like what you think they should look like. This is um, what data look like if you were to graph the AVLT in ADNI, and it's a sawtooth design because two different wordless version, versions were used. Um, at about the same time when I was using echo percentile equating because I was, I was concerned with scores on this one test and modeling change in this one test. You know, um, Paul was interested in um, modeling ADNI MEM and, ADNI in, in modeling a factor score for memory. So instead of having one test, um, you, they, they had a battery of tests, and so they, can, they did an IRT model. And this graph um, is showing the same thing uh, it basically accomplishes the same thing in a, in a psychometric sense um, as echo percentile equating did. Here we had different um, wordless versions. In blue, we had the version at uh, version, wordless version A. And in green, we had wordless version C. And um, the, the fact that the thresholds are on the y axis and different. Um, trial um, wordless um, trials are on the x-axis, and the fact that you see these blue, di these uh, green diamonds that are a little bit higher indicate that the second version, version C, was a little more difficult. This is, an, um, this can be corrected in IRT methods. So it really depends on what tool you want to use, what your ultimate outcome um, uh, or point of the study that you that you want to do. That's all.